join me today as I talk about three camera models from Panasonic, very similar but a little bit different in some ways. Starting with the DMC FP1, going through with the FP2 and the FP3. The first two cameras are relatively similar, slightly different colours these, but one is very different. Very compact, ultra, very compact, ultra compact. They have image stabilisation, which is really good. They only feature four times optical zoom, but it's sufficient enough for a, a bit of a lightweight camera. What's quite nice is the design. You've got this cover that slides up and down to cover the strobe flash, which is quite powerful, and the little lens in there that's hidden away. Having a look further, screen on the FP1 and FP2 are similar, so they're quite small. They are standard screens, they're not touch screen or anything, so all the controls are on the buttons here. And although these cameras don't have full manual control, they do have a lot of different scene modes that you can select, so they are quite useful in that respect. What I like about this camera is the design of it. It's super small, and at the time it was quite a desirable camera to own. You've got a separate power supply and a USB connection there on the side. You normally charge the batteries using a dedicated charger, so what you'd do is have something like this, and it's got the traditional figure of eight planes cable. But this takes um, a little while to charge, and then you're good to go for up to 300 shots. So the camera does feature a mount there for a tripod. What it doesn't have, unfortunately, is a optical viewfinder, so you are restricted to using the screen, which could be a problem in really bright situations, like it would be with similar cameras. The drawback, I would say, with this camera, and I've had this ever since it came out, really, or not long after it came out, um, it's got a tendency, if you're not very careful, to uh, get dust and sort of dirt and sand trapped underneath this slider. And this is what happened to this one, unfortunately. So you can see how the paint has been rubbed off. And this is because this camera just had a little bit of sand from the beach and it got caught underneath. And there's really not much of a clearance there because I suppose you can't have much of a clearance because it's trying to protect the lens to keep it clean. But when something got stuck under it, it kind of dragged it up and down and it was uh, quite hard to get that removed. But uh, on a positive side, it is a black version. So with um, a little bit of sort of touch up paint, this could be sort of taken care of quite quite easily, but um, gonna be more of a problem on brighter sort of finished cameras. So the cameras take, um, an SDXC card, so there's plenty of uh, space on your memory card for these cameras, and 12 megapixels is enough for most people, I would say. What I found when I had this camera is it was good as a, a general kind of out and about snapper, so it took some good pictures, probably less so in low light, but then that is the theme of a, a lot of cameras of this age and earlier, I would say. Um, one of the positives is the macro. Now the macro is probably one of the best macros I've used on a small camera and you can get very, very close to your subject. So what I will do is append some pictures that I took, some macro ones, to the end of this video so you can see what these cameras are capable of. So as I said before, the FP2 is a similar camera. Its only difference is in two areas and that is the megapixels, so it's got slightly more, so you really don't need more. You're talking very small sensors on these cameras, so the more megapixels you use on them, the more uh, grain you're going to see, the more kind of um, artifacts and things. So if anything, you want to perhaps dial down your resolution and um, have less megapixel output pictures, but uh, that's just my opinion anyway. So the other thing with this camera is it has got burst mode, but it will be unable to keep up with this one, which is the 12 megapixel one. And that's really down to the size of the images and the fact that it's having to transfer that little bit more data across. So in burst mode, it can't quite keep up with the FP1. But for all intents and purposes, it's identical. It's got the same placement buttons. This one looks like it's been used very well. It's got some uh, text worn there where it says menu set, but um, everything is, is the same. And in fact, these cameras came out at the same time. So again, that nice sort of sliding cover and you can see the lens. So I believe it's 35 to 140 
mil equivalent the lens and it's four times so a lot of little cameras at the time managed three times optical and then they started to go a little bit higher didn't they and then we got to um, the famous sort of travel type cameras the TZ10s and the ZS7 so they feature really good zoom lenses but these are quite good for just that going out um, of an evening uh, type of camera now moving on this is the FP3 so there were several more models in this range but this is the uh, last one that I have to show you and this came out at the same time but it is significantly different um, it's not different in the megapixel count to the FP2 so that's 14 but as you can see it's got a wider and bigger screen so again it hasn't got optical but you can see that it's significantly bigger now what they've done there is they've reduced your physical amount of buttons so you have less here you've got sort of five I think yeah five buttons and some of the features are on this screen so this now is a touch screen and unfortunately this particular one in my head I got this a few years ago and the seller who shipped it to me it was in perfect condition when he, when he sent it unfortunately for some reason he decided to take the battery out of the camera and have that kind of loose um, in the rest of the packaging so it kind of pressed on the screen and has damaged the screen but it's still usable but it's just uh, obviously an annoyance if you've uh, got something that you want to hold on to as a collector piece for example so again I think we can see evidence of this scratching so it does seem to be a bit of a common problem this one doesn't suffer so bad but you can see a line here so that's quite a a weakness I would say and you can see it here as well so let's uh, turn this around and the placement of the buttons is all the same you've got the two ports on the side underneath looks very similar so for all intents and purposes very similar camera the optics are going to be identical the only difference is this bigger screen so let's uh, power on the FP1 and compare it to the FP3 and to do that, I need to take the battery out and the battery can only go in one way. So you can start the camera just by pulling down. So that goes straight into this setting here. So it's saying, please set the clock. I'm just going to ignore it for now. I mean, it's moaning about SD card now. Let's find out why. I'm sure it had one in. I'm using it, an adapter here. And it's sometimes things just need to be plugged in and out. They've not been used for a little while that time. It's not happy there, is it? Okay, so the SD, because there's not an SD card in there, or it's complaining, it's not letting me do anything. So let's just take the card out because there should be a limited amount of memory on the camera. The problem with these, actually, if you've got some of these, sometimes the adapters, I've only got four gigabyte, so one in there. But um, yeah, sometimes they just need a little bit of re inserting to get working again but let's just turn that on again yeah okay so it's going to keep saying this yes i do want to proceed okay so we're going to go to inbuilt memory and i'm just going to go to look at the picture sizes so you can take it down and that might give you better quality in lower light so you could experiment doing that you could leave it on the default or just maybe go down you probably don't want to go beyond five megapixels maybe eight would be uh, worth trying so uh, let's uh, come back out of there so at the moment it's just set to 200 which is a good all-round value and it can only go up to 1600 ISO so what you need to do if you want to go beyond that you have to select this intelligent ISO setting and that will push it further out particularly in poor lighting conditions so auto white balance is set AF mode is center burst is off digital zoom something I always have off Colour mode is standard, so there's some nice options there. Let's not do that for now. Stabiliser, I've just got set to auto, but there are different modes of stabilisation. I can't quite remember what they are, but I will add a note to the video to let you know. So, onto auto focus assistant lamp. So that's quite a standard setting. And red eye removal is on, so that will be the amount of flashes it does. And then finally, clock set. Okay, so let's go back onto here. Now we've got clock, world time, so you can change it and leave your home time as it is. Travel dates, that's quite clever. It'll automatically do things for you. So that's one less 
thing to worry about when you're traveling. Um, you've got beep, which I've obviously got set on at the moment. I'm going to just turn it off because why not? Volume, LCD mode is off. So this is probably a preview. There's also display size. So that's if you need glasses normally and you just want to whack everything up to big icons. So I won't do that now, but that's generally what it's used for. Focus icon. It's tell you when you're focused. Auto power off is always useful. Probably good to leave that on a low setting there. Auto review, that's how long you get to see the picture once you've taken it in the display. You can obviously turn that off and just look at your photos afterwards. And you've got a reset. So it will say no. USB mode, standard stuff at the time. Video out is power, TV aspect is 16, nine. And then format, now image, and demo. Now let's stick it on demo and just see what it does. Stabilizer demo, there we go. Okay, now the other option you have here is to review. There you go. Press that again to go back. You've also got a um, quick menu. So here, if you're experimenting, you can change your resolution really easily. You've got LCD mode, probably all the main ones. You can force it into using a lower ISO, which is handy. You've also got auto white balance, metering, face detection, burst mode as well stabilizer so that's the various modes I think if you want to go into video you have to go mode and then go down and select motion picture and as you can see it's not going to be recording very much it's uh, it records at 720p this camera scene mode Let's go through the scenes. Lots of them. You really need the manual for some of these just to uh, understand. So as you can see, there's quite a lot there. I've got it set to portrait now. And um, let's just go back to mode again. Come out of there. You can take it straight to normal picture. It's been a little while since I played with this camera. All right, let's press this one. Intelligent Auto. So this will set up and be the, the most useful setting you could want on this sort of camera. So if you're not a very creative person but you just want to get a good picture, then as you can see at the moment, it's putting you into a macro mode. That's because I'm kind of focusing down on the uh, table here. And if I move it around, yeah, it's kind of gone off now onto a regular sort of shooting mode. So that's the camera in a nutshell. I'm gonna just turn this off. Now you can turn the camera on with this cover closed. There you go tells you but you can go obviously go straight in and review pictures so you don't particularly want to uh, do anything else oh look 2010 it says in there so let's turn it off and let's quickly show you the there's no difference on, on the um, FPT but I'll, I'll just show you very quickly that there's no difference Good thing about these cameras is they they all work well. Now this one's got a memory card in that does seem to be registering properly, so the other one probably just needs me to give it a bit of a clean. So the menus are going to be very similar. It's set on intelligent auto, but we can take that off and you get more options. So as you can see, 
it's all very, very much the same. And if we go into quick menu, it's going to be the same. So the only difference is the megapixels, isn't it? So let's just um, go back to that. No, not that. That's um, that's what I want is to go to normal, quick menu, go back. There we go. So we can drop down to 10 and then to 5 megapixels. So I think the FP1 is probably a bit more useful because you don't have to perhaps go down quite as far, but you'll probably get a reasonable return on lower noise in your images if you can possibly go down to say 8 megapixels. But this is only dropping down to 10 because it's starting at 14. So, yeah, much the same. And quickly moving on to the FP3. Okay, so it's saying clock set. So I'm just going to go yes. So you can see it's unfortunately suffering from damaged LCD here, but luckily it's not affected everywhere else, and I don't think it's going to affect things too much. So that's on the exit kind of button there, but uh, you've got various modes, so let's go to ISO, up to 1600, so very similar to the uh, FP2, and even this looks very similar as well, the megapixel count, um, burst mode, AF mode, white balance, so this is what we're kind of used to as people now, aren't we? This is very common to be pressing on screens, but um, I quite like the buttons. And I think with something like this is, as you can see, it's damaged here already, but um, if you do damage it more, then you will just render the camera inoperable. So it's quite nice to have every, everything on a button, but uh, it does seem to be working okay. So let's go to menu. It looks like it might be set up um, in a particular way. What I mean is, so it's very similar, isn't it? I must be missing something here. I'm looking for, looking for the size, if you can change that to go smaller, but I don't know if you can. It's a mode. It's a bit like we saw on the other cameras, but um, this is obviously now accessible from the screen. So if you want to go, I suppose in some ways it's a little bit quicker if you want to go and start recording video, um, because it's just a case of pressing once, pressing once, off you go, record your video. So that's quite nice. Scenery. Okay, scene mode. I see. So you select the scene that you want. So let's say fireworks, you go mode, you're going to get fireworks, aren't you? So I think that's how it works. So display, well let's just go back out of there. This is like the return button, the, uh, the bottom one. It's the same on the other cameras as well. Um, yeah. We've got no pictures in here, so let's try taking one. We don't want fireworks, do we? Let's go back to normal picture. Let's press intelligent auto and let's review this. Very poor settings for taking pictures, it's quite, quite dark down here and uh. So can I just, Ooh, yeah, that does work, doesn't it? So that is letting me zoom in. Oh, two times zoom. Oh, okay. That's not very useful, is it? Because in on other cameras, you can kind of zoom in, not so much and kind of look at the detail. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's come out pretty well. So yeah, looking at the camera, it's pretty well the same as the others. It's got the same 
position AF assist. It's identical lens. So going back, I would probably go back to this one again. It's the one that I've used the most and it's my camera of choice at the time when I wanted something handy that could take really good pictures and, and it, it does give a lot of the small cannons a good run for their money. So I would say that uh, you will be surprised and impressed by the uh, quality out of these. So they're all CCD cameras and they all will have very small sensors, hence why you will get noise and why in low light you will get poorer quality pictures, but obviously there's ways to mitigate that somewhat. And um, yeah, really useful features, obviously the optical image stabilization, which they all have, but this one likes to, uh, to advertise the fact. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this short video about these three Panasonic Lumix cameras and they are definitely worth getting hold of, just even as a backup camera, I guess. They still take nice pictures and they're compact enough to carry anywhere. Just a nice uh, camera full stop. Well, thank you for watching and I shall do some more videos in the future. Please like and subscribe because that means that um, I know what sort of uh, videos to make and I'm aware that um, more people are interested in watching camera videos at the moment. So there's a, quite a keen interest in uh, cameras full stop, especially CCD cameras from uh, a few years back. So anyway, I won't rumble on and um, thank you very much.